Patrick Dory has invented a machine that creates a beach blanket of advertising right in the sand. Wherever we look today, we see the market reaching into every last corner of our daily lives. On this one half mile stretch are approximately 5,000 impressions of Skippy peanut butter jars. Everything's about private property and everything's for sale. Everything from the band shell. That will be $125,000. To the lecture hall. $150,000. Can be named for a price at New Berlin School. It's a phenomenon that's reaching some new and even ridiculous extremes. Even a town selling its own name to an internet company for $75,000. Welcome to Half.com Oregon. One frontier after another reduced to private property. This marks the beginning of the commercial development of the moon. And we suspect we know where it will end as well. And while it's easy to regard these stories as isolated outrages, they're all symptoms of a deeper, more alarming mentality. This is the United States of America. It is a highly competitive economy. You claw your way up on the backs of others. That's the way it's done. Didn't you know that? And over time, we seem to have forgotten a crucial part of our history, the part of the American story that has more to do with our shared interests than with corporate concerns about the bottom line. We become so spoiled by ready access to good food, quality health care, quality homes, new cars, terrific colleges, that we think of them now as things every American is entitled to. But they're not entitlements. They are quality products which are a direct byproduct of our free market. I'm David Bollier, and I've been studying the commons for quite some time. And I've discovered that it has a lot to say about the audacious scams of market capitalism. Global markets have been devouring our commons, our shared wealth, for centuries. But fortunately, a movement of people around the world is stepping up to name and reclaim the commons. It's a movement whose time has come. The majority of young children are apparently susceptible, and something must be done for their protection. It's been said that in the early 1950s, Americans feared only one thing more than the atomic bomb, the polio virus. We must face the fact that any one of these could be the next victim of infantile paralysis. Polio had reached epidemic proportions during the first half of the 20th century, striking without warning and with devastating effect. In 1952 alone, 58,000 cases would be reported, killing more than 3,000 people and paralyzing another 21,000. Most of the victims were children. 1955, a year of anxiety and triumphs. A major medical hurdle was crossed with the discovery by Dr. Jonas Salk of the anti-polio vaccine, which was to spread a mantle of protection over millions of American children. Then, on April 12, 1955, the world learned that a young medical researcher named Jonas Salk had developed a new vaccine that would stop the disease dead in its tracks. It seemed to be a quintessentially American story about a remarkable individual achieving great things in the face of great odds. But it was also something more, a story about how the heroic achievements of one individual were made possible by an equally heroic collective effort. Salk's research was not funded by private foundations or pharmaceutical companies, but by the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, a public effort financed by the donations of millions of ordinary Americans who were asked to give a dime at a time. The seven-year effort to eradicate the disease was less about free enterprise than about a common enterprise to look out for one another, a fact that wasn't lost on Salk when the celebrated journalist Edward R. Murrow asked him who should own his vaccine. Who owns the patent on this vaccine? Well. The people, I, I would say, there is no patent. This is, could you patent the sun? <laughs> Unfortunately, this ethic has become a distant memory, something that would become very clear several decades later in the midst of another devastating health crisis. When millions of people in one part of the world are wasting away from disease, is the rest of the world obligated to help in any way it can? It was the 1990s and the HIV virus was spreading like wildfire in South Africa infecting millions of people, including at one point almost one-third of pregnant women in the country's poorest provinces. And fear would turn to anger and outrage when it was reported that an estimated 20,000 South Africans were dying of AIDS every month 
simply because they couldn't afford to pay $240 a month for the brand name medicines that were readily available to keep them alive. Treating the more than 3 million AIDS infected patients in South Africa is a hopeless endeavor. AZT and the newer AIDS drugs that prolong life cost between $500 and $1,000 a month. That is not only out of reach of the average South African, but also the government. Some patients are not even told the drugs exist. So two years ago, the South African government decided that morally it had to do something. It passed a law that would allow cheap, generic versions of the drugs to be locally produced or imported without the permission of drug companies. But there was one problem. The drug industry argued that it would cut into their revenues in other countries. They called the idea piracy and said it would set a bad precedent for any country to produce generic drugs for humanitarian purposes. The drug companies won. And as a result, lots of people who could have been saved died instead to keep corporate profits alive. Two serious health crises, two different approaches. It's a contrast that captures one of the great unexplored dramas of our time, the epic struggle between the marketplace and the commons. We've lived for so long inside this mythical fantasy world known as the free market that we have trouble seeing what it's done to our culture how it's altered our very sense of the possible, our very identities. We have trouble imagining other ways of relating to nature and to each other. We have trouble imagining other ways to produce what we need. In short, we've forgotten what the commons is and why it matters. In the most general sense, the commons consists of all the things we collectively own and have an obligation to pass on to future generations undiminished. For example, the air. It belongs to all of us, and the idea that anyone can own it is absurd. We call it a commons because our first obligation is to protect it and to share it. The same for water, our ecosystems, our genes, our national parks, the internet and the many things we create online the vast quantities of government research that we fund as taxpayers, our libraries, our local food system, community gardens. To declare that something's a commons is to declare that we have a moral, personal connection with it. It's not just a product or an object. It's a part of me and my community, and it shapes my identity and behavior. There is no commons without commoning, the social practices we use to manage and protect our shared resources. Now, I understand that the idea of the commons seems strange or abstract to a lot of people, but it shouldn't be, especially when you realize it's revealed itself in human cooperation over two million years. Scientists tell us that reciprocal social exchange is even hardwired into our brains and emotions, that we have innate capacities to cooperate. In 1900 BC, in Babylon, there were forestry conservation laws. In Egypt, King Akhenaten, King Tut's father, established nature reserves. And during Roman times, Emperor Justinian established two legal categories along these lines. One, called res publica, included types of property set aside for public use. The other included natural things that everyone uses, the air, water, wild animals, and this was called res communis, the commons. These principles would be taken up a few hundred years later in England, in the Magna Carta, and the often overlooked Charter of the Forest. Both recognize the basic rights of commoners to use the commons, to do things like gather wood from the forest, graze their sheep, and shoot wild game. As commons historian Peter Leinbau has noted, these rights were essential to people's daily lives, making the commons what we might call today a social safety net. In fact, here in the United States, the founders drew upon the law of the commons when they were designing the American system of government. They incorporated many of the rights named in the Magna Carta into the U.S. Constitution. So it shouldn't be any surprise that the Constitution starts with the ringing phrase, we the people. The point was to assert the supremacy of the commoners over and against the claimed powers of governments and kings. Beyond the law, the commons is a deep part of our cultural history as well, from quilting bees to New England town meetings, volunteer fire brigades, and free public libraries. In the early days of the American Republic, many people explicitly talked about common wealth. Several states, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Virginia, actually named themselves commonwealths, 
The idea was that people have responsibilities for their shared resources and they're entitled to use them. This idea has been crucial in allowing each generation to build on the contributions of those who came before. Ben Franklin is a perfect case in point. Franklin, the iconic American entrepreneur, was well aware that he stood on the shoulders of giants in Isaac Newton's classic phrase. Franklin's peers were a huge source of inspiration and influence in his many inventions. So when he invented the Franklin stove, for example, and the lightning rod and bifocal glasses, he didn't patent them to make a private fortune. He knew future generations would want to modify and improve them with their own ideas. Author Lewis Hyde has puckishly called Franklin the founding pirate because of his propensity for borrowing from others. You might say he was the original peer-to-peer -peer networker. The fact is, the history of this country is inseparable from the history of the commons. Abraham Lincoln signed the Morrill Acts in 1862, freeing up federally owned land so that states could build land-grant colleges that would serve everyone, especially in the teaching of agriculture, science, and engineering. The universities of Illinois, Minnesota, Kentucky, Connecticut, and dozens of others are gifts to us from our 19th century forebears. And a couple generations later, Franklin Delano Roosevelt would reinforce the principle of the commons by creating Social Security. This Social Security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. Social Security is a kind of intergenerational risk insurance compact that provides care for the elderly, sick, and disabled. It was part of a much larger vision of government in the service of the commons that was enacted in other projects from the time, like the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration, all of which were designed to lift Americans out of the Depression by giving them jobs, rebuilding our infrastructure and our national parks. And later, Roosevelt would sign yet another piece of legislation in the spirit of the commons, the GI Bill, to help returning World War II veterans. President Roosevelt signs GI Joe's Bill of Rights that guarantees a returning soldier a year of unemployment insurance, guarantees 50% of loans up to $2,000, and helps pay for the completion of his schooling. And in fact, that same year, 1944, FDR set forth his vision of the commons in what he called a second Bill of Rights. His argument was as radical as it was distinctively American. Certain economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. A second Bill of Rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station or race or creed. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative job, the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom, freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, the right to a good education. While FDR wouldn't live to see his vision realized, the point here is that he was fighting for a set of principles that transcended the politics of his own time. And the importance of this point can't be overstated, because for too long, the idea of the commons has been misrepresented as somehow synonymous with big government and the welfare state, socialism or even communism. An un-American, almost anti-American mentality, a mentality of something for nothing. You have a right to a house, a right to a job, a right to medicine, a right to health care. You do not. While the notion of the collective good has a long and rich tradition, there's also been a long and rich tradition of attacking it. The socialists among us seek to bring about a gradual change in our system by gradually destroying the principle of the private ownership of property. It's a pattern of vilification that channels exaggerated fears of socialism and communism into fears of any sort of commitment to the common good, and even social justice itself. One had the hammer and sickle, the other was a swastika. But on each banner read the words here in America of this, social justice. 
They talked about economic justice, rights of the workers, redistribution of wealth, and surprisingly, I love this, democracy. So that now, any talk about cooperation or the common good inspires the wildest accusations and caricatures and hysteria. What we're getting is a big government ideology, government tightening its grip over people's individual liberty at whatever cost that that may be. We are creeping toward socialism. From free market economy to a socialist economy. Why are we headed toward socialism when everything else is collapsing? This is a vehicle to take us down to a path of total socialism and totalitarianism. And this mentality has been music to the ears of corporations and free market fundamentalists who, under the cover of this ginned up fear of government power, have been busy buying up everything that previous generations believed should belong to all of us. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. A sensibility captured memorably in Oliver Stone's classic film, Wall Street. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. And greed, you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Thank you very much. The film may have been fiction, but it nailed a radical market mindset that was all too real during the 1980s. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. When President Ronald Reagan and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher of Great Britain assumed power in 1981, they brought with them a worldview often referred to as neoliberal capitalism. The societies which have achieved the most spectacular, broad-based economic progress in the shortest period of time are not the most tightly controlled, not necessarily the biggest in size, or the wealthiest in natural resources. No, what unites them all is their willingness to believe in the magic of the marketplace. On the American agenda tonight, how a growing number of cities and towns are trying to save tax dollars. It's called privatization, which means that the services we've come to expect government to provide are turned over to private businesses. It includes a proposal to turn the Federal Aviation Administration into a semi-private corporation. Hartford will soon be the only city in the country to privatize all its schools. Correspondent Jack... What was owned and shared by all of us was privatized, commodified, and converted into a total market order. And it's only gotten worse over the past 20 years. One thing I've learned in 40 years of reporting is that the free market does everything better. This isn't Adam Smith's capitalism. It's market fundamentalism, or more accurately, a kind of free market purity that functions as a disguise for crony capitalism, a system of closed markets, cozy government deals, and flexible standards of accountability. And the little noticed drama of the past 50 years is that while a lot of people have been waving their arms about big government, the piecemeal theft of the commons has been accelerating right under our noses. It's a process often known as the enclosure of the commons. The term enclosure is generally associated with the English enclosure movement from the 15th to 18th centuries, when the king and aristocracy and landed gentry stole the commons from the commoners. They saw this as an easy way to enrich themselves, to grab more power and control by doing things like grazing sheep and selling wool to an exploding export market. Enclosures became a way to make some easy money and consolidate political power. The economic historian Karl Polanyi studied this unique historical transition from the commons to enclosure. He noted that for millennia, people had been bound together through community, religion, kinship, and various other social and moral ties. And he found this all broke down as enclosures proceeded. 
When the market became the supreme ordering principle, business became the preeminent institution of society, organizing everything else around the interests of capital accumulation. Polanyi called this the Great Transformation, and he characterized the history of enclosures as a revolution of the rich against the poor. The lords and the nobles were upsetting the social order, he wrote, breaking down the ancient laws and customs, sometimes by means of violence and often by pressure and intimidation. As the market economy gained the upper hand, it imposed its commodity logic on everything. And this is more or less the template for what's happening today. The plan calls for the logging industry to thin out public forests by cutting down trees. The president wants to eliminate appeals and litigation that might hold up logging projects as they did in the past. His plan makes it easier for loggers, more difficult for environmentalists. From the clear cutting of our public forests to the depletion of our national mineral wealth, when it comes to market enclosures, it seems that nature is always the first victim. You may not know it, but you own some gold mines, actually the public land where gold, silver, even uranium are dug out of the earth. You might be wondering about now what you have to show for all that. While the mineral wealth from our national lands is enormous, we in fact have very little to show for it. And that's because corporations have been reaping the benefits of a sweetheart deal that's been on the books for more than 150 years. Though much of the gold will be extracted from land owned by the taxpayers, the company pays nothing for the gold it takes. Companies that mine gold, silver, and other hard rock minerals still operate under a law written in 1872, when Ulysses S. Grant was president. This bar alone is worth one and a quarter million dollars at today's prices. And how much do taxpayers get in return for their gold? Not a penny. It's been estimated that Americans have lost more than $245 billion worth of revenues from this law, while seeing lots of beautiful mountains and rivers ruined from mine tailings and other waste. Oil from public lands? Similar story. It's about oil royalties, the payments taxpayers are supposed to get for letting oil companies drill on public lands. Critics have long accused the U.S. Interior Department of being too cozy with big oil. All sorts of accounting subterfuges have allowed big oil companies to avoid paying any significant royalties to the federal treasury. So billions of dollars for public oil have never been paid. The auditors claim the companies cheated taxpayers out of tens of millions in royalties and that their bosses at Interior refused to collect it, part of what some claim is a culture of not enforcing the law. Taxpayers have lost some $1.3 billion in royalties. The propertization of our shared natural resources is happening everywhere. By one estimate, an astonishing one quarter of all the world's biomass has been commodified for sale in the market. One quarter of the world's forests, crops, plants, and other natural resources. And the latest frontier in this mad quest to turn nature into a commodity is water. There are over 358 million trillion gallons of water on Earth. But not all water is created equal. Fresh water used to flow freely throughout the ecosystem as a gift of nature, until multinational bottling companies decided to prowl the world for supplies of groundwater and turn it into proprietary branded product. Poland Spring 100% natural spring water, born better. So that in the United States, we now consume about 500 million bottles of branded water every week. And worldwide, the industry reaps more than $100 billion a year, even though it turns out that store-bought bottled water is often no cleaner than tap water. Even the most cynical among us would like to think the bottled water we drink comes from a place like this. Still, there are those who long suspected some bottled water was just tap water, and now there is no more doubt. Today, PepsiCo, which owns Aquafina, started labeling its source as PWS, which stands for Public Water Source. Tap water, purified, yes, but from a pipe, not a stream. Amazingly, the private takeover of what used to belong to all of us is presented as some kind of advance for humanity. Meanwhile, 
our public infrastructure for water is crumbling. Across the country, cities are struggling with water systems that are falling apart. There were 123 water main breaks just last year alone. And for many farmers in poor communities around the world, in India, Africa, Latin America, bottled water is sucking away the water they need to grow food and quench their thirst. Clean water has long been in short supply here, but some villagers say their wells dried up with the arrival of a Coke bottling plant three years ago. The point is that this private grab of natural resources has had consequences. The whole market system depends upon constantly cannibalizing and trashing the commons in order to produce the abundance we enjoy. And it's just not sustainable. We can't keep living on nature's capital. And as if this weren't enough, the market isn't just capturing our physical landscape, it's been appropriating huge swaths of our cultural landscape as well, with markets laying claim to our shared inheritance of creativity, information, and knowledge. Culture may be more abstract than land, but it's no less fundamental to human existence and no less profitable to corporations. Consider what corporations have done to the broadcast airwaves, our broadcast airwaves, a key source of information, of entertainment, of education, in short, of culture in the modern world. Now sometimes it's tough to wrap our minds around this, but the airwaves themselves are a gift of nature, and as such they belong to all of us. They were discovered by people who realized that the air was a really good medium for broadcasting signals from one place to another. The problem was that broadcasters' signals immediately started to interfere with one another. It was chaotic with all sorts of static and garbled signals. So to make things work better, Congress decided to give broadcasters licenses. Each of them would get their own exclusive band of electromagnetic spectrum, or channel. The people would still own the airwaves, but broadcasters would get to use them for free under one condition, that their programming would serve the public interest. NBC's obligation to its listeners is founded on its basic respect for the American home. The money that advertisers spend to sponsor these shows pays for other programs too. Non-commercial broadcasts in the public service account for more than 40% of NBC's scheduled time. The logic was pretty simple. If broadcasters were going to be able to use and benefit from such a valuable collective resource, one that today is valued at roughly half a trillion dollars, they had a responsibility to deliver a collective civic benefit and not just a private commercial benefit. Responsibility is the first obligation of freedom. If you take from the commons, in other words, you should give back to the commons. But as with so many other commons, it didn't really work out that way. For those of you with television stations, I have an announcement. As you know, I've never liked big government, and that was one of the reasons I was opposed to the so-called fairness doctrine, as you've already been told. Yeah. And I think you will agree there's no reason to substitute the judgment of Washington bureaucrats for that of professional broadcasters. Under Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton in the business-friendly 80s and 90s, Congress and the FCC deregulated broadcasting striking down policies designed to protect the public interest in the airwaves. So that today, we get a few good shows mixed in with an endless stream of reality programs, sexual titillation, vulgarity and violence, all designed to keep us watching during the 20 minutes of commercials per hour. We don't have more intelligent, diverse programming because commercial broadcasting maintains a tight stranglehold on an invaluable common resource. Now, I go into the example of the airwaves in such detail because history may be about to repeat itself. I'm talking about the corporate enclosure of the Internet. Hands off my Internet. That is what backers of the so-called net neutrality are shouting. The issue is that some broadband providers don't want you to go to their competitors' web pages easily. Neutrality advocates say that you should be able to surf wherever you want without delay. Just as only a few media companies now control the public airwaves, only a few cable and telephone corporations are vying for control of the web. So here we have this massive expanse of limitless information exchange, an amazing resource with incredible democratic potential developed with U.S. taxpayer money. 
but its sheer openness has come to be seen by corporations less as a virtue than as a potential threat. Entertainment industry groups accused hundreds of college students today of being internet pirates and said they will sue them. And we see this kind of reactionary corporate mindset all over the place. Hollywood studios, record labels, and publishers are profoundly threatened by how people can create their own music and video outside of the marketplace and how they can share creativity rather than buy it. So Hollywood and the record labels have run to Washington and the courts to lock down culture with new legal protections, with laws that extend the terms of copyrights, laws that shrink our fair use rights, laws that impose ridiculous penalties for alleged violations of copyrights and trademarks. There was the case of the mother who made a cute YouTube video of her baby dancing to the music of Prince, which prompted Prince to sue her for copyright violation. Now a real-life David and Goliath story over a proud mom's home movie. Stephanie Lenz thought only family and friends would enjoy the short video she posted on YouTube showing her toddler dancing, so she was stunned when the world's biggest music company sent her a threatening letter claiming her video was copyright infringement. Music companies, publishing companies, TV networks all generated 230,000 takedown orders on YouTube alone this year. In 1996, the Girl Scouts and hundreds of summer camps were actually sued by ASCAP, a music licensing body, for singing copyrighted songs like Puff the Magic Dragon around the campfire. Even our nation's universities are aggressively enclosing knowledge that should belong to all of us. Thanks to a law passed in 1980 to encourage the commercialization of scientific research, universities have the right to patent federally funded research. The scientific method requires researchers to keep an open mind, forming no conclusions until their theories are tested and the results can be checked. But can that happen when the funds for the research are coming from a partial source? As soon as universities enter into corporate partnerships, it stands to reason that professors might come under pressure to suppress research that might embarrass their corporate sponsors or threaten their profits. Now, the source of some of that funding has reignited the debate over private money used for public research. Some, for instance, comes from the tobacco industry, which often uses the results to fight anti-smoking measures. Universities are supposed to serve the public good, but increasingly, they're renting themselves out to private interests. And this ethic about owning knowledge has become a cultural pathology. Just look at drug research. Since 1980, U.S. drug sales have tripled. The $250 billion industry has been the nation's most profitable for nearly all of the last 10 years. We're paying way more than any other country per capita for our drugs, and yet most of that is going for marketing, promotion, administration, and shareholder profit, and only about 11 cents on the dollar is actually going back into research. And that's not a very good return on investment. We taxpayers through the National Institutes of Health finance the research that produce treatments for genetic disorders, depression, diabetes, among many other diseases. It's a sweet deal for drug makers. They let us taxpayers finance all the risky breakthrough research, while they get exclusive patents on the drugs, charge us exorbitant prices, and pocket all the upside gains for themselves. So that while academics like Jonas Salk once saw their research as having shared value, corporations increasingly view research in terms of shareholder value. Big companies are also using trademark law to control their public images and prevent ordinary people from criticizing or making fun of their products. Barbie, you're so a few years ago, you had Mattel going after a photographer who had mounted a photo exhibit of Barbie in a series of unflattering poses. Trademark law has gotten so out of hand that McDonald's now claims ownership of the prefix Mick when applied to other businesses or products. So that you can't name your restaurant McSushi or your motel McSleep. The Village Voice once tried to stop other newspapers from using the word voice in their name. And there are actually trademarks for things like the NBC Chimes. This is NBC. And the list goes on and on, all private property. One wonders if the great American pop artist Andy Warhol would have ever been able to paint his Campbell soup cans if today's trademark laws had been enforced 50 years ago. Andy, a Canadian government spokesman said that your art could not be described as original sculpture. Would you agree with that? Ah, uh, yes. Why do you agree? Well, because it's not original. You have just then copied a common uh, item. Yes. Well, why have you bothered to do that? Why not create something new? 
Uh, because it's easier to do. Well, isn't this sort of a joke then that you're playing on the public? Uh, no. It gives me something to do. Andy Warhol understood that art and culture have always depended upon appropriation and derivation. He understood that from time immemorial, creativity has always required sharing, imitation, and collaboration. An idea that's as American as apple pie. Look at our jazz and blues and hip hop traditions. They flourished only because musicians could freely and openly borrow and rework old bits of melodies, rhythms, and lyrics. Look at the American folk tradition, at guys like Woody Guthrie, who openly acknowledged that his music was built on the work of others, built from bits and pieces from blues masters and hillbilly singers and cowboy music, all of it swept up and remade in his own distinctive voice. There was a big high wall there that tried to stop me. The sign was painted, said private property. But on the back side, it didn't say nothing. This land was made for you and me. Well, this land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. The Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream Water. Woody Guthrie, like many artists before and after him, viewed culture as a commons, not a marketplace. So where does all this leave us? The great visionary R. Buckminster Fuller once said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I think Fuller was right. The most strategic and effective way to change something is by pioneering some new models that actually work. And the good news is, this is happening. Beneath the radar of mainstream politics and media, a new movement is emerging around the world to reclaim the commons from market enclosures and to return the commons to its rightful place in our lives. Across the globe, there are now commons-based initiatives to reclaim the atmosphere, fresh water, and public lands. There are active campaigns to protect the internet as a commons, to fortify online communities such as Wikipedia and the Internet Archive, and to defend the freedom of the blogosphere. There are campaigns to strike down patents for human genes. There are campaigns to stop corporate marketing in the public schools. There are countless efforts to relocalize the economy. Iowa families eat carrots that travel 1,600 miles from California. New Yorkers enjoy New Zealand lamb that travels nearly 9,000 miles. And Chile sends grapes 5,000 miles to Columbus, Ohio. Efforts by regions to rebuild local food systems, to become more self-reliant and less dependent upon global markets. It's all part of a movement started by so-called locavores, people who want fresher food and some who want to see firsthand how their food is grown and how animals are handled and fed. It makes you feel like you're in control of what you're eating and what your kids are eating. There are campaigns to protect fisheries from overfishing by industrial trawlers. Now under U.S. federal protection, commercial fishing and oil and gas exploration will be restricted in an area the size of Oregon. It's also a victory for the people of Saipan. The tiny population campaigned hard to protect an area best known for some of the fiercest battles of the Pacific War. Viva Monument! Viva! Preserving the ocean, protecting the environment is very important to our very survival. In this sense, this new movement is an answer to the long-standing criticism that the idea of the commons may be nice in theory, but it's hopelessly naive in reality. A myth that has its roots in the influential work of biologist Garrett Hardin. Well, the problem is this. Suppose you have a commons open to everybody. Everybody can put his cattle on it. Each person wants to maximize the profits from his herd of cattle. So, of course, he wants to add more and more cattle to his herd. In a famous 1968 essay entitled The Tragedy of the Commons, Hardin, in effect, smeared the commons as a failed model of resource management. The trouble is that this eventually overloads the commons, uh, destroys the good grasses on it, results in lesser production of beef from the ground, 
but the loss that's taken by each person is only a fraction of the total loss, whereas the gain from overloading by adding one more animal, he gets almost all of the gain. So he's trapped in a system that compels him and all the others to overload this, each one seeking his own interest. His argument was simple, that a commons nearly always ends up being overexploited and ruined because no one has any rational self-interest in holding back. But Hardin's argument was also wrong because Hardin wasn't really describing a commons. He was describing a free-for-all where there are no rules, no boundaries, in short, no community and no commoners. The irony is that the greatest tragedy is not the tragedy of the commons, but the tragedy of the market, the antisocial abuses that occur through market enclosure. Of course, people can and sometimes do overexploit their shared resources, but that's hardly inevitable. In fact, Professor Eleanor Ostrom of Indiana University won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009 for making precisely this point. Her pioneering work over the course of four decades shows how communities can self-organize to manage forests, irrigation water, fisheries, wild game, and lots of other things as commons. What we have ignored is what citizens can do and the importance of real involvement of the people involved as opposed to just having somebody in Washington or in uh, far, far distant, make a rule, how does that get all the way down to management of forests, fisheries, irrigation systems, etc.? So we have to look round up. Far from being a tragedy, the commons is generative. With the proper structures and social norms, commons models often produce and manage things more efficiently than markets. And in fact, for each of the areas of enclosure we've discussed, we see entirely new models for meeting people's needs. So even as academia has sold more and more of its assets to private interests, we're seeing scientists and scholars in scores of disciplines publishing their research online in peer-reviewed open access journals, bypassing commercial journal publishers who often charge exorbitant subscription fees that university libraries can't afford. And even as corporate enclosures of academia get more intense, a movement of dozens of universities led by MIT is pioneering something called open courseware, in which professors put all of their curricular materials online for free, part of a movement that's trying to recreate academia as a common. And even as corporations are trying to restrict internet access, there's a movement towards open source software programs, like GNU Linux, which seeks to break the stranglehold of licensed software. And even as corporations try to shut down online sharing and collaboration, groups like Creative Commons have invented a series of licenses that let people share their music, videos, books, and writings without running afoul of copyright law. There are hundreds of wikis and websites that let people build their own information commons. WikiLeaks released 92,000 classified military reports spanning six years. Its mission is taking on the powerful and seemingly untouchable and exposing their biggest secrets, chalking up a long list of intelligence coups since it was launched just three and a half years ago by a global mix of dissidents, journalists, and technology wizards. What's incredible is that it's done it all with no paid staff, no headquarters, no home. It's less an organization than a movement. WikiLeaks itself doesn't have a home either, located on more than 20 internet servers with hundreds of domain names, making it virtually impossible. And this is the key for government censors to shut it down. Some people see the commons as another name for resurrecting big government. Not true. Government certainly has a role in helping the commons, just as government already supports markets. But the goal of any commons is to empower commoners to take charge of their own resources and to stand up to government as needed to defend their own more basic interests. That's what We the People has always been about. And while it's squarely in keeping with the American traditions we've been talking about here, it's by no means just an American thing. It's an international phenomenon, or more accurately, a transnational phenomenon because commoners are building new sorts of solidarity as global citizens. So in addition to groups like On the Commons in the United States, the World Social Forum has issued a manifesto about reclaiming the commons. We have the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation in Asia, 
the Heinrich Boll Foundation in Germany, Pachamama in Latin America, the Solidarity Economy Movement in Brazil and other countries, and the International Association for the Study of Commons. The larger challenge has to do with imagination and courage. Our inability to recognize limits to growth is causing so many multiple interconnected crises, environmental, political, social, cultural, even spiritual, that we desperately need a new vision for the future. We need a holistic paradigm in order to protect and preserve our common wealth. We need to imagine a different future for ourselves.